Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I am so honored to be among these esteemed speakers. Um, today, I'll be speaking with you about the use of algorithms at work. Um, before I start my talk, I would actually like to talk to you about how I came about this research interest. So as a graduate student, I was doing my doctoral degree at Columbia University. I was in the field interviewing formerly incarcerated people. And one man had really a tough time finding work. And I asked him, what would you say is the biggest obstacle be between you and finding a job? And this is what he said to me, computers. What? Uh, and then I remembered, most prisoners, or quite a few, aren't allowed to use computers in prison. So I, I thought he was telling me, really, that it was his lack of computer skills that was holding him back. Turns out, that's not actually what he was saying. Really, this is what he was saying. He said, I wish when I went into a store, I could find a human to hand my resume and to say to them, yes, I've been to prison, I've made mistakes, but you know, I've served my time and I'm not that same person anymore. I'm a hard worker. I want to rejoin society. And if you give me a second chance, I will be a good worker. Instead, he says, I never get to meet any human managers. Instead, I have to submit my resume online. And when I submit my resume online, there's a box that I have to check to admit that yes, I have been convicted of a crime. And I think that once I check this box, my application is automatically rejected because I never hear back. So that story stayed with me. Even after completing my dissertation, looking at the reentry of formerly incarcerated people, that story stuck with me because I was like, wait, Computers are supposed to make society better. Technology is supposed to be making society better. But here was someone telling me that actually, in their case, it was making their life harder. So that's what has led me to the study of algorithms, particularly in the workplace in America. So first, before we dive in, what are algorithms, right? You've been hearing that word a lot. I would say recently, and you're probably wondering, what do they, what are they really? What does it really mean? Well, they're not mysterious, they're not mythical, they're not magical. Algorithms are just really step-by-step -step processes for solving problems. They are mathematical step-by-step -step processes for sol solving problems. The difference now is that they're computerized. Some of them are what, what I call machine learning. So let's start with the abacus, right? The abacus is a form of multiplications used in the workplace uh, back in the 17th century, 18th century. So one example is the abacus ring. So this was worn on the finger of a merchant and this would enable the merchant to quickly calculate his business transactions. Now, this abacus ring could not actually be manipulated by human fingers. It was so tiny. So it had to be manipulated with a tiny little pin worn in the hair. So you could say that this was the first wearable tech, right? Well, fast forward to the 21st century, and we now have the Smarty Ring. So the Smarty Ring you can see as an up update of the abacus. But now the Smarty Ring, it can show you your text messages, it could show you your email messages, it can show you who's calling, and it can also measure your heart rate. So we have made leaps in technological advancements since the little abacus ring. And the question is, is this technology really benefiting us? Is it really benefiting everyone? 
So, as one ethical philosophist once said, we should not fear AI, right? Artificial intelligence is proposed to us as a great tool for solving many of society's problems. It's supposed to usher in a golden age of, of equality, fairness, efficiency. Yet, perhaps there's need for caution, right? As recent events have shown us, most notably the Facebook Cambridge Analytica case, algorithms can also be used for ill, right? Algorithms can also be used in ways that don't serve us, but instead manipulate us. Instead, take advantage of the data we have entrusted to corporations in the interest of, uh, you know, talking to our friends, being social, right? So our human impulses to share, right, is being accumulated in big data that can now also be manipulated by algorithms. So there's a need for caution. But Facebook and Cambridge case is really the tip of the iceberg, so to say. And in fact, the arena in which we should be most concerned about how algorithms are used is the workplace. And that hasn't really gotten as much attention as issues on social media, for example. Yet, algorithms are rapidly changing the workplace and will continue to do so for many years to come. And this is an issue because it has been shown that algorithms play a role in maintaining inequality. Because remember, algorithms are not mythical, they're not magical. They're just mathematical step-by-step -step problems, uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, process for solving problems, which means they are really created by humans. So humans determine what variables can go into any given algorithm. And that can be an issue if the, uh, the way the variables are chosen are actually serving to maintain inequality or to benefit one group over another group. So consider, for example, workplace wellness programs. Sounds like a great idea, right? Your work wants you to be healthy because a healthy worker is a good worker. So I'll give you one story, which is Walmart hired Castlight, a wellness program vendor, to run a wellness program and as part of that wellness program, Castlight encouraged employees to download an app in which they track their medications. Now, using an algorithm, Castlight was able to use the data from that app to essentially conclude or predict employees that were about to get pregnant or were already pregnant. And how did they do this? They did this simply by tracking when someone stopped using birth control or when someone uh, uh, got certain medication that were fertility drugs. And ostensibly, this was in service of the employees because then they could send them reminders or, or, or notes as to how to take better care of themselves. But this also raises a troubling question. What if employee, employers could know workers who were pregnant or about to get pregnant? What are the issues of discrimination that could arise from that? We all know pregnant women are discriminated against in the workplace. And in fact, there are laws, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, that protect pregnant women from being fired or being discriminated against just because they're pregnant. However, there is no law that uh, basically would protect women who are about to get pregnant. 
So the fact that the algorithm was predicting not just who was pregnant, but also who, were, who would be uh, perceived as about to get pregnant actually created a legal loophole that employers could potentially take advantage of. Yet another story. Remember that formerly incarcerated guy I told you about who couldn't get a job because he was automatically rejected by hiring algorithms? Well, what if the same was happening to older workers? So the New York Times carried a story that was an investigation by ProPublica in which they found that on Facebook platform, so Facebook now has a, a web page that's solely for jobs, employers had the option of picking target groups. So they could pick target groups by age. And some employers were targeting their job ads only to people who were below the age of 40. So in this New York Times report, one man who was 58 years old and had been unemployed for quite some time, in his area there were several ads for jobs that he was well qualified for, but he never saw those ads because they were never presented to him by Facebook because of the targeting. So this brings up issues of ageism. Will algorithms be used essentially to reject swaths of our, of our workplace just based on age? And then there's the issue of how the algorithms then dictate how platforms are designed. So I, I to, spoke to you already about the, tar, the age targeting. Now consider that when you go to fill out, fill out an online application and you go to enter your graduation year or you go to enter your birth date as some online applications demand, your date is not pre present. So this happened to one man in the state of Massachusetts. When he went to fill out an online application, he found that the birth dates only stopped at 1980. Right? So what, what signal is that sending? And forget signal. He could actually not submit the application because he could not correctly enter his birth date, which was not 1980. It was earlier than 1980. So this is really a very subtle way to eliminate all applicants over a certain age in contravention of the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. So the question is, why should we care? Well, automated platforms are taking over hiring. So many of you here are students, and I know that at least 90% of you, yes, have already submitted an application online. And this will continue to be the case. So essentially, technological advancements are changing organizational behavior. Because these are hiring algorithms are available, corporations are taking advantage of them. Why? because they're seen as efficient. So Goldman Sachs, for example, is going to personality tests, which is another way to automate hiring. So remember that automated hiring is a new trend for vast majority of the retail workspace. But that's not the only space because once again, Goldman Sachs is also doing the same, except now it's personality tests, which are automated. So now they can eliminate you just on the basis of your personality tests without you actually ever having had an interview, a live interview. 
So these hiring algorithms, they don't actually hire, right? They automate rejection. They're culling systems. So they're seen as making the work of the employer easier because now they don't have to de dedicate resources to having a large HR to read through all the resumes they receive. Sounds great, but let's think about some of the ways that this can go wrong. As we mentioned, there's a resume parsing. So you can parse out people just based on age, just by doing something as simple as saying, I only want people who graduated after a certain year, for example. Another example, you can parse resumes based on gaps in employment. So you can train your algorithm to say, if you have an, a resume where there's a gap between employment, just reject that resume. Why could this be problematic? Well, what about the women who have taken time out of the workplace to raise children? What about the men who have done so? What about the people who have taken time out to take care of a sick relative? What about the people who were ill and had to take time out of the workplace to get healthy? Should they not have a second chance to return to the workplace? Resume parsing can eliminate those people categorically. And then there's the idea of pattern matching for resumes with the help of hiring algorithm. What does that mean? So for example, I am CEO of a company, and thus far, all our high-performing people are MIT computer scientists. And I say, well, tell our hiring algorithm, we want more MIT computer scientists. That's what we're looking for, because those are the great people we, we already have. Why is this problematic? Well, first of all, Cornell computer scientists are pretty good, from what I've heard, <laughs> right? So, you're already eliminating people who could already also be potentially as good as the people you already have. Furthermore, what is the demographic makeup of MIT computer scientists? Well, at a lot of the elite computer science, school, computer science schools, you have a predominance of white males. So, Something as seemingly innocuous or uh, seemingly preference-based as choosing only MIT grads can actually result in both a racial, gender, and socioeconomic imbalance in who your applicant or hiring pool actually is. So we do need to think about how these hiring algorithms are used. There are tools. But if used incorrectly, they would not better the workplace, but would instead reinforce some of the same inequalities we already see in our society. Because when you have closed loop reporting, you're just getting more of the same, right? Because as we are using hiring algorithms currently, there's no accountability mechanism where companies are actually obligated to audit their algorithms to see how they're actually working out in terms of societal ideals of inclusion, equal opportunity, and fairness. So what's the problem? Let's, let's think about this again. Some of the computer scientists in the room might laugh at this because Machine learning algorithms will do exactly what they see from the data, right? The training data for machine learning algorithms are really important. Machine learning algorithms are really like children. And just like we teach our children our, our biases, our prejudices, our likes and dislikes, we will also teach machine learning algorithms the same thing. 
And so we have to pause and really consider how can we obligate corporations, firms, to ensure that they're teaching their machine learning algorithms the right principles when it comes especially to hiring. So that means acknowledging the role of the individual, right? Because someone has to train these algorithms. So I want to tell you another story about the mechanical Turk. So currently in society, a lot of times when a company has a bad outcome while using algorithm, algorithms, right? Their response is to say, well, we didn't do that. The algorithm did. Blame the algorithm. So that's basically denying the role of the individual. And the fact is, the individual is always pregnant, present, I'm sorry. <laughs> because, and, and maybe I'm saying pregnant because of what the mechanical Turk really is. So you might have had of Amazon Turk, the workers, right, who are behind the scenes doing the work that algorithms really can't do, but we want to automate. Well, the, the mechanical Turk, the original one, existed in the 18th century. And it was presented as a chess playing machine. It was an automa automaton, as in it was an automatic, automatic chess playing machine. And it would play chess with statesmen like Napoleon, um, like Benjamin Franklin, and it would beat these people at chess. And it was presented as this amazing machine that could beat humans at chess. Turns out, it wasn't automatic. There was a human hidden inside that chess playing machine, and it was a human making all the moves. This is similar to machine learning algorithms, similar to algorithms used in the workplace. There's a human deciding what variables the algorithm should take into account in making its decision. There's a human deciding what training data to use to train the algorithm. There is a human at the center of it all. What if I told you that CEO stands for chief ethics officer. Why is this a new concept? It shouldn't be, right? Isn't ethics the most important thing for a company in terms of ensuring goodwill and trust? Right? Yet, we relegate ethics to an afterthought when it comes to the governance of corporations and firms. But really, ethics should be at the top of everything that a company is doing. And when we, when we accomplish this switch, when we switch to ethics as the guiding principle, as everything a corporation does, then that is going to create uh, an environment where we actually think deliberately and thoughtfully about what algorithms are doing in the workplace and how they're being used, whether they're being used in a way that's ethical for the humans in the workplace, whether they're being used in a way that benefits the workers in the workplace. Now, some people might say, well, we're a business. Right? We're about making money. And if we have to worry about all the ethical things, right? if we can't choose who we think is the best fit for the job and not worry about, well, who's getting excluded, then we're not going to be competitive. But that's not true. It's not a binary question of making money versus being ethical. Instead, being ethical is actually the path to making money. 
How many people have left Facebook since the Cambridge Analytica scandal? Right? Oh, quite a few. And what about the dip in stock for Facebook since the scandal? So unethical behavior for a corporation isn't going to be rewarded. A consideration of tech is not anti-business, right? Being pro-human is not anti-ethical to being pro-tech. Both can exist. Both can work hand in hand. So what is my conclusion for you today? I've talked to you about the use of algorithms in the workplace and some of the issues that can arise from how they're used in ways that don't benefit the individual or that ignore ethical principles, even if it's just within the law. Well, my conclusion is move slow and fix things. We want technological progress, but we should be deliberate in thinking about how the technology we're employing, particularly in the workplace, is serving humans. And that means moving slowly, and that means doing audits, for example. When we have a hiring algorithm that's deciding who even makes it to the interview stage, we should audit that algorithm to see, are there swaths of people that are being excluded? Is the algorithm fair in terms of how it's deciding who should make it past the initial stage? And in fact, is the algorithm even efficient? Because we might think, for example, hiring only MIT grads is efficient. But is it really? Can there be, for example, Cornell computer scientists who are just as good or even better? So the conclusion is really, technological progress is great, but moving too fast can break a lot of things. Thank you very much.